Hi, I'm Sue Stockdale and welcome to episode 85 of the Access to Inspiration podcast, the show with a social mission to help you be inspired by people who may be unlike you. We always hope that their experiences and insights cause you to reflect on your own perspectives about the world and to be inspired. Well, this week is part two of an interview with Myrtle Simpson, a climber and polar adventurer who was the 10th woman in the UK to receive the polar medal. In this episode, Myrtle talks about attending the COP26 UN Climate Change Conference and how she lived for three months with a tribe in the rainforest in Suriname and why everyone needs something to live for. We've talked about your expeditions north. I also know you went to the rainforest. Well, we've had to go there because of Hugh's work. We needed people that had lived on the equator which have never had light. So we looked at South America mostly. And then we thought British Guiana is a place to go to. And so the idea was that I would set off in a boat with the four children at that time. And a girlfriend was going to help me, who also played the flute. And I thought that would be so helpful making friends with the local people. So she and I set off in the boat. But while we were halfway on our six-week journey on the boat, and Hugh was to fly out and meet us at the last minute, and there was all sorts of political troubles in British Guiana. But the next door country, in fact, Hugh began saying, come home. And I thought, what? After all of this effort, not likely. The next country, which was uh, Dutch Guiana, Suriname, well, we thought we'll go there. So a friend and me landed with the four kids and awaited Hugh's arrival. And by doing that, we got to know some gold prospectors who knew a river that if we went far enough up the river, we'd meet people that had never had any light and still hadn't, they knew how far the world prospectors had got or the missionaries had got, but there were still people living further upriver that hadn't happened. So we thought that's the place to go to. So we flew to this guy's gold mine. He was called Papa Tom by the locals. And he gave us an introduction to one of the locals that had come down to trade with him, who took us up to a village of his people who looked at us in absolute amazement, but were thrilled to see the children because other people like prospectors and so on hadn't come with families. So that's why they were suspicious of them, didn't want to make friends. They liked our kids. And funnily enough, one of our second son has blue eyes and pale hair, or he had at the time. So the women loved handling him. Well, anyway, Bruce became the one that everybody handled. So the the rest of our family have always said, oh, I'm that your blue-eyed boy, Bruce. <laughs> so I have to fight that all still to this very day, that I love more just as much as blue-eyed Bruce. But I think he lowered the shutters to make us to make friends with the people who were fascinated by our kids and how I didn't know what to eat in the way of food. So they showed me, you can eat this, you can make bread with this, and they loved doing it. I heard a girl on the radio the other day saying, people don't realize how much it costs to bring up children. Now it costs a pound to buy a bottle of water. Well, I've never bought a bottle of water in my life, wherever I've lived. You soon know what to drink or what not to drink. And the locals will certainly be able to tell you. The time that caught me out was we were actually, we had the family in Iceland and we came across some mushrooms. So we picked them. But my good friend that we needed to carry one of the children, because we had four kids and only two of us and one that could walk, and we needed another pair of hands. She had thick specks, and she stood on them and bust her specks, but went on picking the mushrooms. So that night, of course, cooked up the mushrooms, and I ate a whole lot. And suddenly I was overcome with the most frightful food poisoning. was sick of sick. And my husband, professor, medicine, wasn't the least bit interested in me being sick, but he was appalled that the being breastfed baby would get the mushrooms through the milk. So I lay on the floor being ill, and all he did was fuss about the baby. Anyway, it was just frightful. And it was all because we hadn't got our wits about us. You know, my friend Janet, without any specs, had gone on picking, and I hadn't looked through them. You know, the responsibility was all mine. It was my stupidity. But I'd at them. You always need to know what you're eating. Know your mushrooms before you leave home. Know what's growing, what you can eat, for goodness sake. Well, actually, I asked the National Geographic once, how many people in your association have died in the field? 
And they said it was something like 99 and died in their beds. Most people want to come home from a journey, wherever it is, and expect to get home. And they will get home, as long as they looked at the dangers before they and made themselves capable. I mean, I think a lot of people these days, because everybody needs something to head for. They all need the North Pole, whoever they are. They need the North Pole. You know, I think we strive on, on stress of getting somewhere. And people have made life so cozy. Well, and a lot of people's way of life, suburban way of life, kids going off to nursery school early in the day, when the days that my generation wouldn't dream of putting the kids to school. It was their job to give them their brekkie and likewise be at home when they came with hot scones when they came back from school. Well, that doesn't seem to be a priority in modern families. And I'm, of course, I'm envious of them. It's magic that they made a place for them in the world for themselves, but they'd better be careful because a lot of them have just given out too much in the priorities of life and they're solving the stresses. They've sort of overdone it all right. I think a lot of women have anyway. I have asked all my family, my growing family, because now we're on to grandchildren. I've got 10 grandchildren, and I think it's four or eight. I can't remember how many great-grandchildren. So we've gone on and on. How many of their mums knit, use a sewing machine? I've been in frightful trouble for saying all that. It brings us nicely onto the subject of one of the areas or issues of concern for many people these days is the environment. And I know that you went to COP26 in Glasgow. What did that involve? Well, the first thing was I had a phone call from a man. And I said, who am I talking to? And he said, my name's... Anyway, I'd better not mention his name. And I said, I've heard of that name. And he said, I'm the heir. <laughs> oh, I said, sitting up straight. <laughs> anyway, he said he had a, a bee in his bonnet that if all the world was going to get together about the weather, they'd better face the world word. The most important word is high Arctic because it's the temperature, the world getting hotter, the Arctic is melting, so there's more water coming south, and that is what's going to make the world insufferable and, and man could very easily just end, end being able to live here. So he paid huge sums of his American money into having this meeting. The thing about COP was there were people interested in the high Arctic, there were people interested in geology, of scientists, of this and that, the next thing. Anyway, I said to him, what can I tell the world? Oh, he said, we've looked, we want somebody that's walked or skied across frozen land in the high Arctic. We're looking for someone that's been further north than 84 degrees north. He said, and we started looking for Nansen, he used to be long dead. Which they went all the way down the explorers, apparently, until they came to me. <laughs> and our furthest north we got on our North Pole journey, before our generator let us down, was 84 degrees north. He said, you have done it. Tell us about it. So I thought, well, is there really something I've done that no one else has? So then I realized my age, and I thought, that's a bit of nonsense. And I said, I can't make my way to Glasgow let alone Timbuktu, you know, sort of thing. He said, well, bring a Sherpa. So I thought, okay, I'll take my youngest son, Rory. Well, if you're enjoying this episode, you can listen to episode 84, which is part one of this interview. And there are many other adventurers we have featured in the podcast to date, including episode six, Rianne Manser, who was the first person to circumnavigate Africa by bicycle. And you can listen to episode 56, where I spoke to Mick Dawson, who was part of a team that were the first to row across the Pacific Ocean. You can find them all over at our website, accesstoinspiration.org. So Rory and I set off to go to Glasgow, where it was meeting, and he'd brought with him one of these electric scooters. And I said, what have you got that for? He said, Mum, I brought it for you because the roads are all going to be closed and it's going to be a problem. <laughs> anyway, I thought, as I'd already decided, I couldn't ride an electric bike. I didn't think I'd manage an electric scooter. Anyway, we set off for Glasgow with a friend who had a car, Sean Langmuir, and we found, because Sean knew all the back roads and so on, of course we could drive perfectly well. And we got to this place and I just loved the atmosphere. Everybody there in our pod done something. For instance, I was sitting, somebody had gone for a coffee and said, oh, just sit there, I'll bring you a coffee. And there was a young guy. So we were 
chatting away and suddenly he said, oh, look, those are my slides you can see. Must be my turn. He'd, so he jumped on the platform and only then did I realize he was just back from swimming five consecutive days from the North Pole to show to people it wasn't a joke. It wasn't just a little puddle. It was for real. There was real open water around the North Pole to the extent that he could swim for five consecutive days. Well, I loved hearing him talk. And everybody was somebody. They'd all done something. And this guy who coughed up the money for our pod, he'd actually made a boat of plastic bottles and sailed around the world in it, like Mont Contiki, just to prove waste can be used. You can destroy the world if you don't use what's there. And everyone that we met had done something special. And as I sat waiting for my turn, because I'd been asked to bring about 12 slides, and as we have thousands of slides, <laughs> I'd, anyway, I'd got my slides all right, pictures. But I realized that it, you know, it was very interesting to actually people don't know what it's like, what we're losing. And I'd noticed that there was a very Greenland face. There was a man there who obviously couldn't speak much English, but he had a very perfect Greenland face. Now, nowadays, funnily enough, people don't like to use the word Eskimo. But in our day, the last thing Greenlanders, the Greenlanders wanted to be called Greenlanders or Eskimo. What they did not want to be called was Inuit because they were the wrong people. They'd gone north from left to right rather from They were very fussy about that. Like now, you've got to be very careful. (laughs) You don't mix up your words. My family always say to me, Mum, you can't say that. (laughs) Nowadays, anyway, I just do needless to say, so I get into deep trouble. He was obviously a Greenlander, and he didn't speak much English, but he had slides that he immediately showed of people on the beach, kids playing with their their dogs, sledge dogs, and having terrific fun and just growing up, and women making the clothes and all from fur and so on, all this interesting. And then he just just went, pushed his arms aside, gone. Or only word he could say was gone. And what he was really getting the message and why they'd asked him to come was that because the sea had got so warm, it had risen three feet where he lived, his world, the whole world, had just gone. He couldn't travel. He couldn't get the family food in because the snow had gone. There were no dogs. Dogs had be, all been shot or eaten because they couldn't go inland and hunt. They couldn't get to their seals because there was no frozen sea. So they were now relying on being fishermen. And luckily, because the sea was thawing, they could get big enough boats to go far enough out to get the cod. They never got the cod before because that was under deep water. But suddenly they found they could, in fact. But as far as culture was concerned, their way of life had had it. It had gone. And all the people all around polar regions' lives will be untenable. And that will happen to the West unless we wake up and stop using our coal and leaving our lights on and so on. That was the message of the whole thing. And of course, there were some brilliant scientists there. In fact, there was an ordinary, I was going to say wifey, because that's why I spent a lot of my life in Glasgow, a wee wifey. And we were just talking, mutually made friends and were chatting away. And it turned out she was actually the leading scientist in Cambridge at a very special institute and was a botanist. And she was just a world authority on what she was talking about and began to listen to the other people. And you suddenly realize that there are people that knew things And I was talking to a man, and I realized he was a journalist of some sort, and his jacket moved slightly, and I saw he was actually the editor of the New York Times, which I suddenly thought, who was I talking to? (sighs) Anyway, he said to me, have you seen my rainforest? And of course, I said, no, where? And he said, oh, it's in the basement. We went down and down and down, and then he pressed some sort of, we were in what looked like a huge, great, big warehouse, and he pressed something, the door opened, and you could feel the rainforest. You know the rainforest. You know it immediately if it's the real rainforest. You feel it in the air. And I was just gobsmacked and stood there and realized that we were just standing in the middle of huge, great big barrels, and they each had a tree in them, and the trees were straight from the rainforest. And at the end of all this, local school kids were going to plant these out. So Glasgow, somewhere or other, near the center of town, now has a rainforest. Anyway, his whole point was that unless we can handle the temperature of what we're doing in the world, that not only will we lose the rainforest, but you know everything else that grows, unless you listen to the scientists who are going to tell you what will grow, which will probably mean three quarters of the world's got to change 
the vegetable it grows or the greenery it's going to eat. You know, they need the botanist to tell them who could become the most important. You know, it's no point in having a farmer if he can't grow his stuff because it's too cold or too hot or whatever. Anyway, I loved this rainforest and it was just magic to see it there and to realize that that's what we need. It's all in the air. It's the temperature. And you're going to find that in the high Arctic. Well, things are changing so quickly. And you have seen so much change in your lifetime, Myrtle, and had so many experiences. I'm wondering, you were leaving a message for our listeners to perhaps reflect on. What would be an important message that you would want to share about life or about what you've observed about life? Well, I think the people that are living are ones that have got faith in the future. You've got to, you've got to have something to strive for. I think people have got so used to not having anything to strive for except money or whatever. Just look at the old ways of life. Don't dismiss your grannies as, what is it they used, used to say in class? Don't teach your granny to suck eggs. You know, listen, listen a bit more to the oldies. What did keep people going when the people weren't earning the sort of money they do day, today? It's possible. Thousands of people showed it can be done. You've got to have something to strive for. And if you can't think of anything to strive for, because we all thrive on stress and something to head for, you'd better find something mighty quick because that'll be your downfall. It'll be psychological, in other words. So find something that's worth fighting for or striving for. Go out and don't just sit on your sofa and thinking, oh, woe is me. What could I do? Well, you could perhaps cook some scones and take them to some hungry man sitting on the pavement somewhere. Or There's something for everybody to strive for. We need stress to keep going and you, know, you can do it. Even by little little footsteps, you'll get there in the end. And I can see an awful lot of hopeless people, you know, at all ages. And I can't bear to see the young not getting up and doing something. And I see it happening. Well, you've given us such a sense of possibility and how you've just got on and done stuff and taken small steps, Myrtle. What's your next small step then? What are you looking forward to doing next? I want my nasturtiums to grow long. <laughs> no, seriously. Well, the winter is coming down, so can you cope with the cold and the dark and, of course, the loneliness? But I think you've all those things you are doable. And if you can't think of anything that will give you enough stress, write a book. Do something. Don't just sit there waiting for the world to fall in around you. And don't allow yourself to be pushed into a corner. <laughs> And if any of my family are listening, they'll probably think, oh, that awful mum again. But, you know, I do mean it. I do think that people with the best intentions, perhaps. I mean, all this fuss at the moment about care homes. Oh, they're all closing. There's not enough staff. I remember the days, the hardly such a thing as a care home. Who looked after the elderly and allowed them to decay? Perhaps instead of saying, oh, the care home won't let me visit granny. What's granny in the care home for? And start why? This feeling of doerness and despair that I see around me in my own community. People far too young to have despair have got it. Even kids begin to say, oh, what's the point of going to uni? You know, it's, it's worth learning something. We can't save the world, but I think a lot of people have given up. You certainly haven't given up, Myrtle. You've given us a sense of vitality today, energy and belief in doing things and taking small steps and it's been an enormous privilege for me to talk to you today and to hear about your life and your experiences so thank you so much thank you very much well i hope you enjoyed hearing from myrtle simpson about her extraordinary life and if you're not planting nasturtiums yet or swimming in a river then maybe it's also inspired you to find something to focus on for 2023 next time i'll be speaking to tyrone mathurin who transformed his life after a serious motorbike accident and is now a motor racing driver and part of Team Brit. I hope you can join us then.